Okay, thanks, Miller. We're going we're actually going to shift gears a little bit now, but actually these talks are going to be at least related a little bit, and I'll I'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, I just have to find the right talk here. Uh, let's see. It's on here somewhere. Let's try. Let's try that. See if that works. Okay, I'm going to be talking now quite a bit about several topics that have actually been of interest to me for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, I will also put in a plug right now that if you're familiar with the Plant Management Network, um, focus on cotton specifically. The most recent seminar that is there is going to cover a lot of material I present today, today in great detail. It, it came up the 1st of January, so it's a brand new talk. on. It's on the Plant Management Network on Focus on Cotton. It's, it, it deals with the crop rotation. Um, now I've been with Mississippi State University since 1980. When I moved to the state, I'd never seen cotton grow. I'd never seen rice grow. Never seen a lot of crops grow. I was trained in Kentucky in the Midwest working on corn and soybeans. So I've spent the last probably 20, 25 years working on corn and cotton, but I got away from rice a good many years ago. But I've worked on a lot of different things over the years, including sunflowers and mustard and medicinal plants and herbs. But today I'm gonna to talk about three different areas. One, I'm gonna, the first, and most of these will be really fast and basically summaries. I'm gonna talk about the long-term cotton corn rotation work that I had going on starting back in 2000 that actually was an in a nitrogen by potassium test. It's a four by five factorial, 20 treatments, five replications. I'm not gonna talk about those other than the average across all of those plots put together. Uh, the second thing I'll talk about is the centennial rotation. The centennial rotation was established in 2004, which is the centennial year of the Delta Research and Extension Center at Stoneville. I'll have quite a bit of data on that, what, what's going on. Uh, that's my claim to fame. And then the last thing I'll talk about is a new project that was initiated last year with Cotton Incorporated. Uh, this project is looking at combining crop rotation and some cover crop work. So this is the first cover crop we planted this fall. There's both a test and also a demonstration going on with several different cover crops where I want to look at the rate of accumulation of dry matter and nutrients within that cover crop. So that's more what I call a demonstration area. The two cover crops that I'm using predominantly in the main study is hairy vetch and cereal rye. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, different times during the, the studies, CI has actually sponsored part of the research that's been going on on very different, various different areas in the crop rotation, in some nematode work that's been done, and now on the cover crops and stuff like that. So, you know, their support for, for, for my work has been tremendous. I really appreciate that. And that wouldn't be possible without the producers in the state of Mississippi also supporting that program. The first study, this is the original study. There were nitrogen rates by K-rate study. Those, these gives you the list of treatments there, but the data that I'm gonna be showing you is actually means across all of that information, looking specifically at the rotation effect. I was using uh, insol in this case and liquid potash material for the potash source. Um, at two different locations, at the Delta Research and Extension Center in Stoneville on, on a sandier soil, down at our satellite farm at Tribbett, which is a silty clay loam, silt loam type soil. Uh, they don't have quite the same yield potential, but they do have significance in this study. This gives you kind of a layout of what the fields look like. If you look in 2000, this, this 2000, this plot right here, now this is in the same field, so you had corn, cotton, cotton set going across the field. This area that was in corn, it was the first year it was in corn since anybody could remember. The next year it was in cotton, the following year it was in cotton, in 2003 it was back in corn. This goes all the way through from 2000 all the way to 2006. Now, in 2000, we did not have cotton following corn in this situation. So the 2000 data, I'm leaving out some of that information when I start looking at the averages. But uh, this is an interesting slide. This is taken actually in 2003. This was the third year of this study. But this is the field as it appears from a, from a remote image. You definitely see the corn area at the bottom. Now the area in the middle 
is cotton following corn, and the area at the top is cotton, I mean, I'm sorry, the middle is cotton following cotton, cotton following corn. Now you see distinct areas here. Now if I put a line there, it's very obvious. If I put a line there, it's very obvious. But the only difference between those two cotton areas is one follows corn, one follows cotton. The treatments are all the same, the planting date is the same, the management is exactly the same. The only difference there is one follows corn, one follows cotton. Now, at the end of the year, when I average those 100 plots in each one of those areas, the difference there is a total of 229 or 230 pounds of lint. Now, I attribute that to the rotation effect. I get this benefit, this 230 pound benefit, strictly from rotation, because everything else out there is exactly the same thing. If we look at soil types, they're the same, so this is what I call the rotation effect. Now, the rest of my talk will be talking about the rotation effect. So to get into the results, this is the, the corn yields. Now this is from 2000 to 2011. This is the, the corn yields, again, averaged across all plots, all in, all in treatments, all K treatments. This is an average of 100 plots. So you can see that in the first year, in 2000, we had a yield in the field of 141 bushels of corn per acre, poor. But the Zoriel damage, I mean, a lot of you remember what Zoriel, what the white looks like on, on susceptible crops. I had some spots in the field that actually died from Zoriel. But then if you look in 2001, now we're two years away from Zoriel, we got yields of 238 bushels per acre. Now it's averaged across 100 plots out there. So on the average, this field has averaged 11 year average because we, we threw away the first year has averaged 195 bushels per acre. Now there's some range out there, and there's some reason that we're getting some of the problems that we get, but I'm not, really, not gonna really go into that great deal. But 11 year average, 195 bushels per acre corn. Now look at the cotton. The, the difference between the two bars here, yellow is cotton following cotton, green is cotton following corn. Now, if I look put in here, okay, that is the percent increase in yield of the rotation effect. Now the thing that's really interesting is you look in 2004 and 2007 we actually reduced yields with crop rotation. Now think about what what a crop looks like when you rotate with corn. The cotton crop tends to be bigger, tends to have a better more aerated root system. Now what happens when you heard what was said just a few minutes ago about bowl rot? When you have big bushy plants and you don't get much air moving through the field, we get a lot more bowl rot. So the things that really we saw in those two years, and I'll go into a little bit of detail in just a few minutes about why we saw that. But we did have two years. Now, the average for all the years put together, we average re rotation responses 139.2 pounds per acre per year. Now that includes the two negative years. So when you start into a rotation system, Mother Nature doesn't tell you up front which year she's gonna mess with you. You don't know that up front, but it's gonna happen. I promise you, it's gonna happen. So, you know, you see quite a bit of variation here, but in most cases, we see anywhere from a, a, a 10 to a 50% increase in yield based on this crop rotation. Now this is the Tribit, this is a satellite farm, a little bit lower yield potential here, but you see the same type thing, variation. Now we did have a rotation already going at Tribit when I started this big test. So this 141 in year 2000 was typical of the, of the type of yields we had on that, which is a poorer soil and doesn't have as high yield potential, but it's still, so it is figured in here. Now this is a 14 year average. We averaged 180, or 181 bushels per acre on the corn. So we've seen, we've had some 200 plus bushel yields in there. We've had some 141. Part of it here tends to be how well we get it irrigated and how much water we can get in. Uh, this is the same slide I showed earlier. This is tribute. This is cotton following cotton versus cotton following corn. Look in this case, you only see a situation where you only have reduced yields in a very, very few years. If you look at 2001, is about a 5% decrease. 
In 2003 and 2004, it's about the same yield. Now, there's something that happened in there. When you start into a rotation system, you start looking at materials that you use, whether it's an inferro insecticide or an inferro fungicide, an over-the-top uh, grass control material. Some of these things are antagonistic. You can't use them together. So one of the things we ran into in growing corn is being able to fight Johnson grass and Bermuda grass. So we ran into some issues here. You know, following corn, when the first year of, of, of uh, cotton following corn, we ran into some weed issues. So this, in 2003 and 4, generally that's what that's related to. Uh, so some of the factors that really affect this, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that can interact. The biggest and probably the most common is going to be some type of a weather-related phenomena. Um, we also have nematodes and other pests, and I'll show a little bit of data there. Differences in disease pressure. So there is things that are going on in that rotation system that because it's a rotation system, it really makes a difference. So remember I told you earlier, we talked about um, 2004, that 8% that, uh, decrease in yield with the crop rotation at Stonewall. This is what the rainfall looked like in 2008. Look at May and June and July. Tremendous rainfall in June, 12, almost 12 and a half inches of rainfall in June. Now cotton, if it's growing really, really well, what's happening to the fruit? Mm -hmm. Falling off. So when you start taking that kind of stuff, then that bigger plant later on in the season, so that's why I think we have the potential for decreasing yield. Let's take the same situation. This is moving to Tribbett. Let's look at one of the big years. There's a 50% increase in yield. Let's take the same look now at weather. Okay, this is rainfall weather for, for uh, Tribbett that year. Now look at your rainfall total for April through September, 10 inches. But if you look at June and July together, less than an inch of rain in those periods. Now granted, this is irrigated, but irrigation is not the same as rainfall. Never has been, never will be. No matter how good you are irrigating, Mother Nature does it better. So here's a case where in really, really low rainfall, that rotation effect tends to be bigger. So uh, I mentioned these earlier. Let's go down and look now at uh, nematodes. I've got, I had a four-year study. This is 2008. This is both locations. The, the crop in red is the crop being grown that year. So this is your corn, this is cotton, this is cotton. So this first set of bars is corn following two years of cotton. This is cotton following a year of corn. This is cotton following a year of cotton. So if you look, the, the sequence, the blue is planting, samples taken at planting, yellow is taken mid-season, green is taken following the crop. Now when we're growing corn, this is reniform nematode numbers, You'll see right across the bottom that there is those nematodes don't build up. Okay, growing corn, which is not a host for the reniform, you see those populations are held constant. But look at cotton. Now this is the post-harvest numbers here. Okay, this is the DREC location, not a real high pressure like it is at Tribbett. If we go to Tribbett and look at that same thing, this is 2008 data, again, the corn Following the cotton, we didn't see a buildup of those nematode numbers, but look at what happens with cotton following corn. You know, once you start putting the cotton back, numbers jump up again. Two years of cotton following cotton, the numbers are even greater. We did, we've done this several years, you know, the very similar pattern in 2009. We did see a little more issues at the experiment station um, in 2009, but we're still seeing that same pattern. That when we when we put corn in the system, the numbers stay down. When we take corn out of the system, they start going up. Now the rotation effect, you know, is this related? Absolutely. We're gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about the centennial rotation. The centennial rotation is kind of unique in that most of your long-term rotation studies across the state are actually built based on replication in time. You have a set of treatments this year, the next time they appear is another year. The study I have is actually a replicated study. It has a series of systems here. Now, this was a cotton-based system. So the only continuous crop in here is cotton. So, and, I, and for some reason, I still don't remember why I did it in, 
in 2004, um, I did put a corn soybean rotation in there with no cotton. Now today, that's really important, but I'm not sure why I did it then, but I did. So the way this thing works out, we have treatment one is continuous cotton. Treatment two and three are a one year corn, one year cotton rotation, but I have two sets here so that I grow corn every year, I grow cotton every year, they just swap. So they're still rotating, but every crop is grown every year. Because some years we have a really good corn year, some years we have a really good cotton year. Based on the prices, you know, there's variation there. So when I go to a three year rotation, this is one year corn followed by two years of cotton, we've got that same thing. All three crops in a rotation system appear every year. Okay, same thing, the corn soybeans, the, the, this third system here, this is soybeans, corn, cotton. In the literature, it talk, we see a lot of evidence for increased corn yields following soybeans. We've seen a lot of data for increased cotton yield following corn. So the, the logic is to plant soybeans to get the benefit for corn, to get the benefit for cotton. So that's what that system is. And then the last system, again, related to the fact that this was a cotton-based study, it's the same soybean corn, two years of cotton. So. You know, this is what the field looks like. It's actually, the plots are, are um, 215 feet long, eight rows that I divide into four subsections. So I actually have the same treatment in the field 16 times each year. I've got four subsamples and four replications. So every system here is appearing 16 times a year. So uh, I'm, I've already mentioned some of this. Um, the, the cotton is single row <coughs> irrigated, the corn is single row irrigated, and the soybeans now are a twin row irrigated. And this is a modern rotation study, so we take advantage of the technology that's available. We harvest the center two rows of each four row plot. Now, this is what the field actually looks like. We're, we're actually irrigating this whole field from this center riser. It only has a four inch well. So we end up having to irrigate one replication at a time and we surge it ourselves. We run it through, run it to the next rep, come back, run it through again because the runs are only 215 feet. So we run it fairly slow and it's a tedious process and the farm manager is relatively patient because of mixing three crops in the same field. So um, I admire him for that. Now he was my technician 35 years ago. So, I mean, he has some experience in soil fertility. Each year, I don't expect you to, to, to be able to even read all of this, but we go in and we keep track of all the yields in each treatment each year. And so that's what this field is. So it's got corn yields on here, it's got soybean yields on here, and it's got cotton yields on here. So now what I want to do is, is just look at continuous cotton yields versus cotton following corn. Now this is what that looks like for each year. If we look now at the differences here, remember before I, I showed you there was a couple of negative years. In this particular study there has been no negative years. In other words, cotton following corn has always yielded better than continuous cotton. Now that average has been 222 pounds per acre per year or a 22%. Now this is even better than what we've seen on the other areas. So this, but this is a 22, 2200 pounds, or basically a quarter, a half a bale of lint per acre per year. Now, one of the things that's interesting, look here at 2013. Now 2013, we had continuous cotton yields of over 1400 pounds per acre. Okay. The yield range out here has been plus 8%, 9% up to about 40%. Well, let's go here and look at that 2000, 2013. We got 1,400 pounds plus of, of continuous cotton yield, but when we rotated it with corn, in this particular year, that's another bale of cotton, 500 pounds. So this one averaged 1,452.1, the other one averaged 1,952.1. So exactly 500 pounds higher yield. Now that's averaged across, remember, four replications and four subsamples. So there's 16 observations going into that. So I think it's for real. The other thing that we've been inter interested in and keeping track of is nutrient uptake. You know, in, 
cotton in general is not a heavy consumer of nutrients like the grain crops are. So we keep track of, this is a summary across everything that's been grown from 2004 to 15. This is estimated based on numbers that are provided through IPNI and University of Auburn has got, and University of Georgia has got estimates. We're not actually measuring these, we're just estimating. So if we take a look at, at some of the particular crops here, this is continuous cotton that I want you to look at here. Whoops. Continuous cotton, we're talking about a total now. This is across that, that uh, 2004 to 2015, a 12-year period. We're looking at continuous cotton has taken up, taken up 2,000 pounds of nitrogen uh, and 1,450 pounds of potash. Now let's look at what happens if we talk now. That's uptake, but we don't take that all of that out of the field. Only thing we're taking out on soybeans is the grain, corn is the grain, and cotton is the seed cotton. So we're taking both grain and lint out of the field. So we've done the same thing here. We've calculated uh, nutrient removal. So this is kind of a summary there. You've got continuous cotton here with uh, respect to nitrogen. And this is the corn soybean rotation. This is no cotton. This is going strictly from a continuous cotton system to a grain crop system. So if we look, the nitrogen removal growing to grain has increased 225%. P removal, 151%. K removal, 78%. Not as bad on K as it is some of the others. Sulfur, 82%. So we're looking at at least a 75 to 225% increase in nutrient removal when we start growing grain crops in there. And you see various in-betweens when you've got corn and soybeans both in that system. So the third topic I want to get to, and I've got about, looks like you're about five or six minutes left. Um, the third study is the brand new study that we just started in 2017. This is also a project supported by CI, where we're actually looking at a crop rotation system and also cover crops. And the cover crops that we're looking at in this particular study are hairy vetch, which is designated as HV, and CR is cereal rye. We're looking at a system that only uses cereal rye or only uses cereal vetch. The other system actually uses a combination of the two, you know, a legume and a non-legume in, in separate years. So that's what this is all about. Now, you know, in general, you hear a lot about cover crops. You know, cover crops have been around for centuries. It's nothing new, but it is new to a lot of people. So, you know, the, we know that cover crops, they slow down erosion, they're supposed to improve the soil, they're supposed to smoke, and I say supposed to. Does it really happen? That's up for you to decide. Um, smother out weeds. Uh, some cover crops don't smother out the weeds. Weeds smother them out. Uh, enhanced nutrient uptake, moisture availability, control beneficial pests, bring, bring a, a host of benefits to the farm. Now. The, the source of this information is managing cover crops profitably. It's the third edition. It comes from the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education. This is handbook number nine. It's about 250 pages and can pretty much tell you all the propaganda, uh, I'm sorry, all the information you need to know about cover crops is in that book. And they've updated, this is the third edition. Now, what really matters? Cover crop economics are rooted in nitrogen dynamics. Okay, tying up nitrogen, releasing nitrogen, producing nitrogen. <coughs> you know, how much is saved, how much is produced, is it released? Okay, fuel cost. And that fuel cost is also associated to, with nitrogen, but also the number of trips across the field. When you plant a cover crop, you've got to plant the cover crop. You also got to try to kill the cover crop. You may have to try to kill it two or three times. You may have to roll beds. You, you know, all of that stuff comes into play. But a big thing that, that triggers here is commodities, commodity prices. When you go to the bank, you've got to explain to the banker what you plan to do. Now, if you've got something in there that you're doing that you can't pay for or you can't see a profit from, the banker goes, how are you going to pay for that? Okay, so you got to, so economics is a key to this whole situation. Now, you know, producers are, are around the country are increasingly looking at long-term contributions of cover crops over a long period of time. But if you can't pay for them over a short period of time, you've got to weigh these kind of things together. And I'm not going to tell you what's the best way to do. Um, you know, most successful are those that have, have seen the benefits and are committing to, committed to making the cover crops work. They, 
modify their plans based on the cover crop. They don't try to push the cover crop into an existing system. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, this retooling of cropping systems is, is really important here. So, you know, and a lot of this thing is regional. You know, where, where cover crops work, the biggest issue we have in the Mid-South is beds. You know, we use beds to get water on and off the field. Now, how does a cover crop fit in that situation? How do you plant a cover crop, you know, when you're trying to deal with beds? Having a field full of water and a cover crop doesn't necessarily make it a very easy system to work with. Conservation tillage is the other one. You know, how do you minimize the trips across the field yet are still able to go in and get that cover crop working? So, you know, I've already mentioned a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we hopefully we can reduce the need for herbicides. If we can control resistant weeds like pigweeds with a cover crop, that cover crop could cover what you would be spending on herbicides in the fall of the year to control pigweeds, for example, or any other resistant weeds. And we've got a lot of them. Um, you know, uh, the other thing is that many of these cover crops all offer possibilities for forages, for grazing. Now, in the Mississippi Delta, are we going to graze forage crops? The deer might, a rabbit, maybe a coyote, if a coyote will eat any kind of forages. But in general, we don't have many animals. So grazing is really not, so that's what I talk about that regional differences there that, that are occurring. Uh, the disadvantages, we had a workshop here a few weeks ago at Mississippi State. And, uh, you know, it was going really, really well until the entomologist got up there. Now, Dr. Gore, I don't think he's in the room anymore, but he took the hit because some of the things that, you know, that we're dealing with is, is you know, I asked a guy, you know, because a lot of talk been talked in the Delta about using crimson clover. Do you see any crimson clover in Mississippi Delta? No. Why? Overwintering heliothus. You know, you, you saw what Miller talked about. I mean, Tucker on the uh, um, budworm, bollworm. Crimson clover is a well-known overrunning host, alternative host for heliophis. So, you know, that can be a problem. Um, I went out to a field where I was in con conservation tillage planting soybeans one day, and the first pass down through there, I got to looking. I called Dr. Gore. I said, I need your help. we got a problem. I took my fingers and raked up about 50 grub worms out of an area about this big. And he said, once he got there, he said, those aren't a problem. How do you know? He said, I can tell by looking. You know, you got to have a spyglass here to look, but they don't have a little black dot back here, so those are okay. But for me looking at them, if I was a fisherman, I'd be a happy camper. But I've raked up about 50 grub worms out of a very, very small place. So, you know, being able to, you know, to get insect pressure off this system, get it out of the way, you know, cut worms, wire worms, you know, there's a lot of potential when you put something green out there in the field. Um, some of the basics, you know, some of these things are easy to establish, some are not. Drill versus broadcast. Put it out with an airplane, put it out with a tailgate cedar. You know, when do you terminate? Um, trying to incorporate residue. All of these kind of things are, are something that you have to deal with. The big question that came out of this, some people believe that you need to have a green bridge. Something green to something green. Others argue just the opposite. You need to kill this cover crop at least two, three, four weeks before you're going to plant the row crop. So, you know, so that's what my statement, to bridge or not to bridge. I don't have an answer there. Um, this is what the study looks like that I've got going this year. Um, this is just to give you an idea. I have, do have subplots here, the eight row plots, but I will put in a nitrogen component here because one of the things that I recognize as an issue is the fact that with certain cover crops, to decompose that cover crop, you've got to take up nitrogen because it's a high CDN ratio, you've got to have it to break down. Same thing is true with the legume. You know, you may, need to, you may be able to get by with less nitrogen if you can get it to decompose. So the other study, this is a, what I call a demonstration study. I'm looking at cereal rye and hairy vetch, but also triticale, wheat, uh, oats, and Austrian winter pea. These are the seeding rates. The, you see sections out here. These, what I did in the field was I worked the field, put out my fertilizer, rode it up, knocked it down, rolled it, planted it. Okay, in this particular field, I did the exact same thing, except in the middle section right there, I only, I did all of that, 
knocked it down, left it, did not overseed it with a cover crop. And you see the little gray stretches out there? Those are the areas that are rode up, were not knocked down. And I am, I'm interested in, you know, we used to use winter weeds as a crower for years. You know, hen bet, yellow top, pretty good cover out there in the wintertime. So we've gotten away from that because of the problem with other weeds. But this is just what I call my demonstration. What I hope to be able to do with this is it, it, starting in sometime the first part of February, start looking at the growth on these things, on these uh, cover crops to see how much vegetation I'm getting, how much dry matter, how much nutrient, how much nitrogen, you know, so that I have an idea of what's going on there. So, you know, I basically have, have covered most of these things. You know, in the original study we saw about a 9 to 18 percent, 17 percent increase in yield from the rotation effect. But we do have that possibility of negative. You know, I showed you some of the yields there. On a centennial rotation, we're averaging about 22 percent. Um, we, I didn't mention this, but corn following soybeans has surpassed corn following cotton by about six and a half percent. So we are seeing better, which would we expect, you know, with corn following the legume, we see about uh, about a 12 bushel increase there. Um, nutrient uptake depends on it on that crop being grown as to what you're going to take off the field. So the thing that really comes into play here is that when you start talking about people who want to burn or bale or remove stover for bioenergy. When you start taking nutrients off in the stover, now what I showed you was nutrient removal. When you start taking everything off, then you start looking at those uptake numbers. So, you know, I don't think that's a very good situation, but the, the final point here is that soil testing is really the key here. That if you're running grain crops, it's going to be really, really important that you know what your soil test levels are. So with that, according to mine, I'm two minutes late, but I will stay for questions. Uh, if there are any, be sure that you sign the back sheet if you're, if you're here for CEU units. And I really appreciate your time and attention. I'll be around if you have questions at any time. I remember, I'm what's between you and lunch. So I, I take care of questions that way, see? So. <laughs>